Going to the hotline now. Our next guest you can see every afternoon on Fox Bet Live on FS1 and uh, also on social media. Todd Furman is with us here on Ruskin and Zach. Todd, good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing very well this afternoon, gentlemen. How are you boys faring? Good. Good. How's, how's your week going? <laughs> Everything okay? <laughs> it's been a little bit more eventful than it normally is when you infuriate an entire fan base. But to all of Arkansas Razorback Nation, I applaud the level of creativity that Photoshop jobs they've done with my face mm-hmm. have sent chills down every family member's spine <laughs> that they've seen so Which far. Which one was your so favorite? My, mine was the favorite. Uh, my favorite was the, the picture of you on Eric Musselman's shoulders. <laughs> I enjoyed that one. <laughs> you know, I've been to plenty of Diamondback games in the past. I just had never gone uh, as a guest of Eric Musselman. So it was a little bit unique to see that picture finally surface. But it did look like Muss was supporting uh, the local team there. That's right. <laughs> so so what happened here? Like, what is, the, what is your side of what happened here? Because we've all seen the clip a million times by now. What happened? So first things first, I want to get one thing out there because I think a lot of folks believe this is a personal vendetta on some level, and that couldn't be further from the truth. When you're a sports better and a handicapper, you have to be as objective as possible when it comes to trying to place a quantifiable value on any team. And whether it's Arkansas basketball or football, whether it's a NASCAR race or any other sport under the sun, as soon as you allow emotions to infiltrate your betting, you're going to be soon separated from your bankroll. So for me, of course, coaching plays a massive role, especially in the NCAA tournament, when you talk about a 36-hour turnaround. And despite what Coach Muss has done in the past, whether it's building this Arkansas program back uh, into a shell of what it was in the mid-'90s, or even recreating a lot of what he was able to do at Nevada, resurrecting that program, there are some questions on the resume. And for me, a lot of it stems from X's and O's and in-game execution. And when you look at Chris Beard, Calling him the better coach in that particular matchup, in my opinion, wasn't as big a leap of faith as people thought. Going into that game, he had the best active Division I winning percentage of any head coach that had coached 10 games in the tournament. Better than Coach K, better than Roy Williams and Calipari, uh, but to the Razorbacks' credit, they were able to build that double-digit lead and hang on for dear life late. So if people don't like the way I evaluate head coaches, that's why they play the games. And in gambling, I'm allowed to be extremely fluid with my opinions and assessments. So I, I I don't think there's any doubt that and, and I know Razorback fans will you know get all rough get their feathers ruffled. I mean Chris Beard has a better resume than Eric Musselman does at this point. I mean he's been to a national title game. He's been a runner up. I mean Texas Tech was a really good team. I felt like when when I you know you can you can listen, make a, a sound clip say anything you want, but when I listened to it, it, I think what you were getting at was the like you said the 36 hours the matchup the Chris Beard thing. They, they're just hard to prepare for, and I think that's where you were kind of going with this. And there, there's no doubt about it. And to Arkansas's credit, they endured the storm early on. They fell into that early 10-point hole and were able to battle back, committing on the defensive end and finding an ability to make easier shots than what the Red Raiders could do through the better part of 35 minutes until all of the prayers that they were hucking from beyond the arc gave them a chance to win it late. And I think so much of what you do in any sport, if you're going to handicap, you have to try and attack who can make better in-game adjustments. And I was surprised Texas Tech couldn't figure anything out from the offensive side. And it has nothing to do with what unfolded in the last 90 seconds uh, when you look at how a narrative can change should Texas Tech have won that game. Every game a coach goes out there and wins, it's another notch, so to speak, in that coaching resume. I mean, guys, we can relate it to the National Football League. How many years did all of us make fun of Andy Reid for his poor clock management until he finally got over the hump? Now we talk about him as the best head coach in there. And if Arkansas can continue this run, maybe get to the Final Four, or win a national championship at 22-1, to suddenly all the questions we had about the head coach are answered, and that will be adjusted in my power ratings going forward. All right, we're talking with Todd Furman here from uh, Fox Bet here on uh, Ruskin and Zach, I, I just, uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, Muss here through two games. I, I think he's one of the more uh, Im- impressive basketball coaches that I've seen uh, anywhere. I mean, just the, the, the level of detail in the, the, the preparation and, and the things that they're on top of here has been something that this program hasn't seen in, in, in a really, really long time here at Arkansas. That's, that's how I see it. And honestly, he's done an outstanding job building Arkansas up in a matter of moments, so to speak, in the grand scheme of things. And he did something similar at Reno. But building a program up and being able to recruit at a high level sometimes doesn't always translate to winning national championships. Now, getting to the Sweet 16 is a major milestone for a program that has been starved for that since the mid-'90s. 
And I think just scratching the surface for what they can do, when you look at the amount of talent on that team and how good they've been with Justin Smith in the fold compared to when he's not out there, we'll see them not maybe get tested this game uh, against Oral Roberts in the Sweet 16, but I think that game against Baylor could be a seminal moment for where Arkansas goes, not only for this season, uh, but how they can use it as a building block for next year. How maddening has it been for you as a, as a, you know, a handicapper, a better this tournament and all of the upsets and the things that have just the wacky things that have gone on through, you know, the first two rounds. It's definitely challenging. I think when you look at a tournament like this, all self-contained, uh, the biggest questions we had were how these teams were going to respond. We saw some of the videos on social media, teams frustrated with their diet, their workout regimen and everything else. And then Virginia kind of being that outlier example who basically flies in the day of and is forced to go out there and play a basketball game. Uh, but ultimately, you assess every single game independently, and while people become enamored with some of those conference narratives about how bad the Big Ten has been or how good the Pac-12 has been, X's and O's are going to trump everything else that's out there. And we're going to see two Pac-12 teams doing battle between USC and Oregon, who played earlier in the year. But if you eliminate some of that conference stuff, other than maybe college football, where we've consistently seen the SEC beat up on everybody else, this is all about... Who's out there on the court for that particular game? It doesn't matter what zip code they hail from. No. Yeah, and I would, just from a, I was thinking about this the other day, with these early round games, as a better, do you do you make any big plays in the early round, or do you wait till the 16, the round of eight, something like that? Because the, it just seems way too unpredictable like to, to go in big on a first round game. You know, it's a mix of things, honestly. It all depends your level of familiarity, oftentimes, with some of the lower-seeded teams that can be perceived to be over- or undervalued, uh, as the case were. One of the biggest positions I took in the round of 64 was on Grand Canyon, plus 14.5 against Iowa. And, guys, I'd be lying if I said that was the dead right side. I mean, Grand Canyon had to fight tooth and nail to stay in that game against the Hawkeyes team who I've been critical of, mainly because I'm not a believer in Fran McCaffrey, and we saw how ill-prepared Iowa was to take on Oregon in the round of 32. But for every game that you happen to get lucky or a game that goes exactly the way you drew it up, like Wisconsin, North Carolina, I think my Tennessee ticket laying eight against Oregon State uh, was officially a tax write-off about 90 <laughs> seconds into that basketball game. <laughs> and, and it's easier, honestly, for those games to go, hey, look, I didn't assess these teams correctly. Uh, I tip my hat to the odds makers who beat me and try and come out and figure out where you're going to fire that next bullet, whether it's later in the day or deeper into the tournament. If I gave you Gonzaga... And I, or the field, which one would you take? Right now I have to take Gonzaga. I think when you look at this team, how deep they are and the variety of ways that they can beat you, uh, I mean, this team is scary from an offensive standpoint. Corey Kispert was in foul trouble early on yesterday. Hey, look, no big deal. Drew Timmy went out there and took things over. Jalen Suggs is the kind of talent that Mark Few was open and honest that they didn't even go out there and recruit because he didn't think that Suggs would want to come play for his program because it didn't fit the mold. But at this point, what they're building in Spokane is special. Uh, and I've kind of said since the middle of the season, if Gonzaga can't win a national championship with this collection of talent, they may never be able to get over the hump. But all that being said, when you look at the bracket and try and figure out the kind of recipe you'll need to beat them, I don't think it's anybody in the West region, whether it's USC or Oregon. SC is nice with an NBA-caliber player and Evan Mobley in the middle, but I don't think their guard play uh, can rival what Gonzaga will throw at you. I'd probably say that Alabama would be the team. We saw them get white hot from beyond the arc yesterday against Maryland. We've seen it a couple times during the SEC play. And when you look at how Nate Oates has got this team to commit to playing defense, Alabama, for me, at least, has the pieces on paper to put a bigger scare into Gonzaga than any of the other 15 teams remaining in the field against them. Of the teams that are you know, perceived long shots, whether it's UCLA, Oregon State, Syracuse, Oral Roberts, which one of those teams do you think has, the, I guess, the best, the best shot to get to the Final Four and possibly the, the national title game? Uh, you know what, I think by default I'd probably have to make a case for Syracuse. Uh, and when you look at it, it's hard to argue with how well this program has performed over the years as an underdog. I mean, some of the numbers are absolutely staggering for what Jimmy Beheim has been able to do when this team is catching points. Now, the 2-3 zone, when you have a few extra days to prepare, a little bit of a different animal compared to going into it, you know, in just the 36-hour turnaround time. But when you dig into some of those numbers, guys, and I, th I was blown away by some of these trends as well. I mean, Syracuse, as a double-digit underdog, actually has – excuse me, not as a double-digit underdog. As an underdog in general, uh, has a 
winning record uh, in terms of a straight-up basis over a 30-plus game sample size going back to 1985, and they've improved to nine and or ten and one against the spread as an all-time double-digit seed in the NCAA tournament. So we'll see exactly what Kelvin Sampson and company can kind of throw at that zone. Probably not the best matchup for the Orange there, given that they don't protect the defensive glass. But I think Syracuse would be a double-digit seed that I'd have a little bit of confidence in, uh, just because Beheim has been there and he surprised all of us in the past. All right, we're talking with uh, Todd Furman from uh, Fox Bet here on uh, Ruskin and Zach. Uh, should we get to Arkansas versus Baylor, Todd? What do you think the number would be on that? Uh, I'm looking at that game right now about four and a half, five, which may be a touch rich uh, in that particular matchup. Well, perception plays such a big role, guys, this time of year in terms of what odds makers are ultimately going to do. When you look at Baylor's prices, I think a lot of people would be surprised that they're laying the same number against Villanova as they are against Wisconsin. But this is a Baylor team from a matchup standpoint that I think sets up really well against Arkansas. But Arkansas could have an edge in the paint. If they're able to get to the glass, uh, they'll have an opportunity in that one. Uh, I'm a little bit higher on Baylor than I think even the betting market is, so it wouldn't shock me if it opened a shade lower if Arkansas went out there, beat Oral Roberts by north of 20, and you saw Baylor struggle to find separation against Jay Wright's team. Dare I ask who you like on Saturday, Arkansas Oral Roberts? <laughs> <laughs> You know, honestly, guys, when I look at it, I went back and watched a little bit of the first meeting between these teams earlier in the season, a game that was played 87-76. Well, one thing I couldn't get over was the way that Arkansas was able to control the offensive glass. 24-7 to in that department. If there's even a little bit of nerves or jitters for Oral in this particular spot, things can snowball quickly on them. The one thing that they have as a mid-major is two guys that can fill it up. And Max Asmus, who I butcher his name all the time, and Kevin Obenor up front. But I think this is where the clock can strike midnight for Cinderella. So my early lean is towards Arkansas here. I actually made them a shade heavier favorite. I'm just real reluctant to lay a price this large, uh, this deep in the tournament. I'm actually hoping the total comes down a bit because I think this game could go over as well. I'm always amazed that at the information that, that guys who, who do what you do have at your fingertips. We've got a ship sideways of the Suez Canal right now. What are the odds that this thing's actually going to get out of the way? <laughs> you know what? I, I'd have to make sure I had the depth of exactly where that <laughs> ship was stuck. Uh, I knew the turning parameters mm -hmm. on the particular model ship and everything else. Like I tell people, whether it's a wedding and how long a marriage or an engagement will last or anything else along those lines, you know, give me a few numbers, give me about 45 minutes, and I can set a line that I feel relatively comfortable with. Uh, there was nothing, gentlemen, that put me to a bigger test than trying to uh, get a little action on Division Three football back in the day. <laughs> wow. Because I'm not going to lie, waking up for Division Three football at noon Eastern uh, when you're working the sticks, it was always first and nine for the good guys and first and 11 for the visitors. So it's a little bit of edge that we had working in our favor. <laughs> well, um, hey, uh, I think you've, uh, you've been a good sport about uh, the fans here being uh, pretty upset with uh, what you had to say about uh, Musselman and everything. But, uh, hey, you know, it's uh, it's not personal. It's just uh, It's just looking at things from an analytical standpoint, I suppose. Exactly, and that's the one thing I wanted to kind of get across, and I appreciate you guys inviting me on. If not a personal vendetta or anything else along those lines, if anything, living in Las Vegas, I should be unhappier with Chris Beard, who basically spent about nine seconds on campus at UNLV before heading <laughs> off to Lubbock uh, for that particular job. Uh, but it's all about the numbers, and I think it'll be interesting to see how this Arkansas team fares. And I love a passionate fan base that they want to defend their own. I'll always respect that and never have anything negative to say in that regard. What, right. I, I, just one more question. We, we, over the summer, we started betting Ukrainian table tennis. What's the weirdest <laughs> thing that you've placed a bet on where you were just like, this might be over the line? Uh, to be honest, guys, I spent a semester studying uh, in, in Australia my senior year, and I had no idea what the rules of National Rugby League were. It's probably the closest version to American football. So when I was over there, I would actually try and chase a little bit of steam in some of their OTB-type establishments. <laughs> At, sitting with some of these Australian guys, I would more or less walk around the room, get a straw poll on who everybody liked. I would bet the other way and hope it paid for a couple of beers. So that was probably more off the wall. And then uh, I did bet a cricket test that I thought would be over in a day. Had no idea some of those things last for like five or six days. By the time that event ended, I'd forgotten that I'd even placed my bet. Never again will I invest in <laughs> something like that where I have no idea what the rules are, and it takes six days to actually get a result. Yeah, that's true. All right. It's Todd Furman. You can watch him on a Fox Bet Live weekday afternoons on FS1. Thank you, Todd. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure, gents. All right. Todd Furman here on uh... –
Ruskin and Zach. Well, we didn't scream at him, so no, we're we going to get yelled at by Arkansas yeah, fans. I'm sure over us. that. But I mean, I mean, it, it's a, it's you know, it's a, it's one of those things. You know, I, I don't think there was. I do think there may be a bad beat in the uh, Nevada Reno days that we need to look into here at some mm. point. But well, he says no, so I don't know. I don't know what you want us to do there. 